Hey guys, today's read aloud is called The Legend of the Lady Slipper, and it's an Ojibwe tale. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but basically it's a legend that was passed down from another culture, and it's going to tell us the story of how this flower called the Lady Slipper was created. So when it's a legend, remember that means that there might be some truth to it, but the whole story is not generally true. So a legend usually is told to um, tell how something came about. So like why the moon and the sun are never out, it's like, you know, they are out at opposite times or like how the Indian paintbrush came to be. So this is gonna tell us about how the lady slipper came to be. So at the beginning, it has what's called a foreword and not like moving forward. This is called a foreword. So these are the words you're supposed to read before you read the book. It kind of gives you some background. It says, after the snow has melted in the Northern forests, you may chance upon graceful flowers shaped like tiny moccasins. Some are yellow and some are white, some are pink and both or some are both pink and white. All are lady slippers, the most rare and precious flowers of the North. This delicate plant grows from the foggy ground of a black spruce, soggy ground of a black spruce bog or the rocky soil of a jack pine forest. It takes 14 years before the first bloom appears. If left undisturbed, it will grow into a thick cluster of flowers, which will bloom for another hundred years or more. However, if any part of the lady slipper is picked, the entire plant dies. How did such a delicate flower come to grow in such rugged country? This Ojibwa legend will tell you. Once there was a young girl who lived with her mother and father, sister and brother, aunts and uncles. Her many cousins, her grandfathers and grandmothers, and all of her people in a village among the whispering pines. All of her, of her, all of her family, her older brother was her favorite. He was as strong as a bear, as fast as a rabbit, and as smart as a fox. Do you remember what kind of figurative language it is if it's comparing two things and it uses like or as, like as fast as a rabbit? It's a simile. Because of these traits, he was the messenger for the village. When he went on his journeys, the little girl begged to go along with him, but all he would say was, maybe tomorrow. Has your mom or dad ever told you that? Usually the answer is actually no. Then one day a terrible disease struck. The little girl watched as one by one her people became ill. Her grandparents, her aunts and uncles, her sister, her mother, even her father fell ill. A neighboring village had the mashkiki, the healing herbs they needed, but the journey was too dangerous to make in winter. It was too cold, the snow was too heavy, and between the villages lay a deep, dark lake covered with groaning ice. Such journeys were not made in Gichi Manadu Gisus, the great spirit moon. Still, her brother said yes, he would make the trip. But then even he became ill. Now the little girl thought surely there was no one else to go, unless she herself were to make the journey. Maybe tomorrow, she thought. But looking at her brother, his face bright with fever, she knew she had to leave right away. She found her moccasins, the beautifully beaded moccasins her mother had made out of deer skin, and tucked warm rabbit fur inside them. Then she slipped them on and stepped out into a raging storm. Trees lashed about in the wind, rattling their branches. Falling snow stung her face. Mosh was in, it hissed, be strong. The girl bent her head and stalked like a bear into the storm. The snow tugged at her, but she charged through it, plunging into the wind. And so you can see right here, the illustrator put the author's words right here in the wind like it's actually talking to her. All day she walked until at dusk she stood before the windswept lake. The slick ice lay as if asleep, silent. On the far shore, the wigwams of the other village glowed warmly. The little girl stepped out onto the frozen lake and the ice shuddered and woke. Dada, Tibin, it rumbled. Go quickly. 
So the girl ran like a rabbit, skittering and slipping. Did you hear that other simile, ran like a rabbit? And here it shows the Isis words to her. When she reached the other side, all the people rushed out to meet her. She told them her story, and when she finished, she saw their faces glowing with admiration. Then an old woman swept her up and carried her into a lodge. She fed the little girl roasted venison and warm tea. She tucked her in with soft robes. The girl was almost asleep when she remembered the medicines. The mashkiki, she murmured. We will bring you and the Mashkiki to your people, the old woman whispered, tomorrow. It is too dark and too cold to travel tonight. But when the little girl closed her eyes, she saw the sad, pale faces of her family, her friends, her brother, and she knew she must leave right away. She rose quietly, gathered up the medicine bundle, and crept out. The storm had stopped. Now all was deep, cold, and silence, except the popping and cracking of the trees. Her eyes stung. She felt the frost gather on her cheeks. She pulled her robe tight and hurried across the lake. Blue and green lights flickered in the sky. She knew the lights were the spirits of the dead, gaily dressed, rising and falling in the steps of a dance. Jibayag Nimawag, her people called them, the Northern Lights. What if someone from her family or one of her people were to join them because she had been so slow? She left the lake and quickened her pace, keeping her eyes on the lights in the sky. So think about where you've heard that the northern lights are, and that will give you a clue to where the setting of the story is. Suddenly, the snow collapsed around her, and she was buried up to her arms. She kicked and punched at the snow. That was no use. She churned her little legs as fast as she could, as if to run out of the snow. That only dug her in deeper. Above her, the dancing spirits leapt and spun. Maybe she would be the next one among them, she thought. She fell back, exhausted. Nibwakan, the snow around her whispered, be wise. Yes, she must be smart like the fox who thinks his way around the trap. So in this one, we can see the snow whispering to her to help her. She lay back to think and felt the snow relax its grip. She lay further back and let it go a little more. Slowly, she wriggled and turned, paddled and swam her way out of the snow. hoo she sang out. Her feet were free. But then, go in! Oh no, she cried. Her feet were bare and cold. Her moccasins were gone, buried deep in the drift. She dug in the snow, but it was too soft and loose. She wiped her nose on her sleeve and continued on barefoot. With the very first step, icy crystals cut into her flesh and her feet began to bleed. In every footstep, bright red drops of blood mingled with the white snow. Still, she stumbled ahead until dawn when she reached the edge of her village. There she called out before sinking into the snow. The people from her village, even some of the sick ones, ran out when they heard her cry. They carried her back to the lodge and wrapped her swollen and bleeding feet in thick, worn deerskins. Because of the mashkiki, the people were healed. The little girl remained weak for a long, long time, but soon after the snow melted, she too recovered. When the frost turned, or when the forest turned green, she and her brother went to search for her lost moccasins. What they found there filled them with wonder. On the very spot where she had lost her moccasins and wherever she had stepped with her bleeding feet, beautiful new flowers grew. They were pink and white and shaped just like the little moccasins the girl had worn on her journey. The Ojibwa people named the new flower Moccasin Wabigwan, which means the moccasin flower. Today, it is also called the Lady Slipper. The people gave the little girl her name too, 
Wa'ane, or little flower, because although she was as strong as a bear, fast as a rabbit, and smart as a fox, she was also as lovely and rare as a wild spring flower. And then at the back, the author has put a note in here for us. It says, never pick a lady slipper. If any part is picked, the entire flower dies. And it grows there in the northern woods to mark the courage and strength of a small girl who lived long ago. A girl who saved all of her people from a terrible disease by listening carefully to the whispering snow, the rumbling ice, and the dancing northern lights. This unforgettable retelling of an Ojibwa legend shows how a child's lost slippers became one of nature's loveliest spring flowers. So, um, there is a message in this story, and it's a message about how nature is full of wonders and all these beautiful things that we don't really know how they got there. I mean, other than God made them, but it's fun to kind of make up some legends sometimes um, in other cultures about how these different plants um, and parts of nature got there. Um, another message that was found in this story was that goodness and perseverance will bring rewards. It says the community is important and it's right to sacrifice for the good of the community. So this story also kind of goes along with what you've been learning about in social studies about how to be a good citizen. Um, so sometimes what that means is doing something that maybe is hard for you, but is going to help a lot of other people. Um, think about like a firefighter, somebody who works hard um, to keep your community safe. Um, it's hard to run into a burning building knowing that you might not come back out, but it's something that they do because that's what's good for their community. That's um, the role that they've taken on and they know that that's doing more good for someone other than just themselves. Um, same thing for a police officer. Um, think about some of the scary situations that they get in sometimes. Um, they're doing that because it's better for their community and they're keeping citizens safe. And the same for all of the doctors right now um, and the nurses who are still working uh, during this time to take care of sick people. There's a chance that they could get sick, but they do it anyway because that's what their role is in this community. It's not just about themselves. And sometimes you have to make a sacrifice for the good of your community. So I hope that you enjoyed um, your read aloud. Today for reading, you're going to be working on um, making text connections. So go ahead and check out the other reading video that I'm going to post and that'll give you a little more information about that.